Okay, so my talk is on the beauty of Japanese knives and other tools. And um, just to sort of front load this, um, I'm by no means an expert on, on this topic. This is sort of something I just have an interest in. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the things that I know in regards to this topic, um, which I believe to be factual, but you know, there could be mistakes in here. So I would be uh, diligent and do your own research if you're going to go off of anything I say on here. And um, also, I'm going to be talking about uh, Japanese hand tools as well. And I am a super amateur woodworker as well. So I, I'm not going to be able to speak too in depth about um, woodworking in general, but I have a sort of fascination with some of the tools. So we'll first kick off talking about uh, Japanese, Japanese knife types. There are a, a plethora of um, different varieties um, out there. I'm not going to be going through an exhaustive list. I sort of selected a bunch that I found sort of interesting, ones that are common, uh, and some outliers that I think are just sort of good for comparison. So the first uh, category we're going to talk about, sort of broad category, is going to be double beveled knives. Um, I think this is going to be most similar to what you're used to in your kitchen. Like pretty much all kitchen knives are going to be double beveled. Um, you can kind of see it here that each side has, you know, a, um, an edge to it. So they're both tapered in. So these are the two bevels. So this is something we're going to see um, pretty consistently across the next few items. So the first one we'll talk about is the uh, paring knife. Now, this is something you are probably already aware of or have in your kitchen. The, the Japanese paring knife is um, very similar to its uh, Western counterpart. You know, it's a fairly small knife, 80 to 100 millimeters. Uh, and this is used primarily for uh, fine detail work, uh, peeling, um, of course, paring, and, um, you know, fits quite well in the hand. So if you need something that's quite nimble and quite delicate, uh, you know, you're probably going for something like a paring knife. So the Japanese equivalent um, uses a different steel, which we'll talk about a little bit of a different handle, as you can see from the, uh, the image here, but by and large has the same purpose as the Western equivalent. The second variety is um, the petty knife. Uh, again, there is a Western equivalent of a petty knife. Um, these are again used for peeling and shaping, a little bit longer blade and uh, ideal for slicing fruits and vegetables. You can also use these for preparing like um, herbs and garnishes. So anything that takes sort of fine chopping work, um, you might reach for something like a petty knife. And again, you'll see from the, the Japanese um, version of this that it has a little bit of a different handle and um, you know, the blade is mounted to the handle a little bit different than what you might be used to in a, in a Western style. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, the um, uh, Nakiri. This is particularly uh, by Takeda. And um, I have one of these myself. It was uh, something I wanted to get for a long time. Uh, as a vegetarian, this is essentially a vegetable cleaver. So it's good for processing um, loads of vegetables really efficiently. Um, it has a bunch of unique uh, features to it based on its shape, which is, you know, quite tall, um, has a square butted end. So you can kind of use it like a spatula. So you chop a bunch of things and then you can kind of scoop, um, you know, vegetables off the cutting board into a, into a frying pan or into a bowl. And because it is quite tall, you have a lot of room to, um, fast chop against the knuckles. And it's quite safe because you have a lot of vertical room. You're not going to accidentally slip off or anything like this. So um, I'll show you the one I have in a little bit, but um, yeah, it's quite a beautiful knife. You can see this one has a uh, bit of a rustic finish. You can get some that are finely polished, a little bit more um, presentational, but I love the rustic look of this one. This is probably going to be one of the most common uh, of the Japanese knives, one you'll find in um, more Japanese households and kitchens. This is a Sentoku. Um, Sentoku literally translates to the three virtues because it's especially great at chopping meat, fish, and vegetables. So if you were to only have one Japanese knife in your kitchen, 
the Santoku is sort of the go-to um, kitchen chef's knife. It's not especially large. It is, it does have a fairly, um, uh, it is fairly tall. So again, similar to the Nikiri, it gives you lots of room for chopping against the knuckles where you're not going to end up accidentally cutting yourself and, you know, can be used to scoop food because it is, again, quite tall. This sort of looks like a cross between the Santoku and the Nikiri. Um, the Bunka is, again, another home chef's knife. This is a little bit less common than the Santoku, but um, it is considered like a general purpose kitchen or chef's knife. Notice the distinctive angled uh, tip on it. Um, this allows you to do more detailed scoring work. So if you were scoring um, eggplants or zucchinis and you needed a, a finer tip for scoring, um, this would give you a little bit more control in that way. It's also not quite as tall as you might find in a Nikiri, but you still have a lot of room for chopping. Um, it is quite large. So you can still scoop with it. Um, and I learned that the tip is, is uh, called a reverse uh, tanto tip. The Gyuto is also a chef's knife. This is probably a little more common in like for professional kitchens or for professional chefs uh, rather than like the, the home chef. Uh, the blade is a little bit longer. It's a little less tall. So you tend to make, uh, can make longer cuts. This also is, um, probably more suited for cutting meats and fish where you do need long, precise uh, cuts um, without having to, um, you know, stroke the blade back and forth. Of course, it can also be used multi-purpose for cutting vegetables as well. The blade itself is a little bit less broad than the uh, Santoku, so it has a little bit less friction when cutting because of the uh, shorter height, um, but uh, would be a real, common, useful, all-purpose knife in the kitchen. And this is also a double bevel knife. This is getting into something a little bit less common. Um, I was fascinated by this one because again, it, it sort of has the same height as the Nikiri um, while having a similar shape to the Santoku. This is the uh, Funayuki, this is a fisherman's knife. Um, and translates to going on boat because this was a knife that um, Japanese fishermen would commonly take with them on the boat and could be used to uh, clean and fillet um, small to medium fish like right on the boat. So sort of a, a rustic um, on location knife. Um, it seems like something that would be great to have in the kitchen. Although I, as a person who doesn't eat uh, fish or meat, I think it would probably uh, not actually see its proper usage, but um, they are quite beautiful and, and I, I love the shape of them. Um, we'll also take a look at a few single bevel knives. So you can see in this example, like one side of the blade is going to be um, ground flat while the other side has like a single edge. So what this is going to do is give a little bit more precision in cutting. You tend to be able to lay uh, closer to whatever you're cutting, whether that's to a cutting board, um, the skin of a vegetable, uh, cutting closer to a bone. Um, et cetera. So it seems to be a little bit more precise and a little bit more um, specialized. The uh, Usuba is a really interesting um, example of a single bevel knife. It has some similar uh, characteristics to the Nakiri in that it is somewhat tall. It has a bit of a flat end to it. Um, this would be a bit more of a specialty knife. It is meant for cutting vegetables, similar to the Nikiri. Um, the blade is super thin and super precise. So if you do need to make precise cuts, that's not going to bruise the fruit or bruise the vegetables. Um, this would be ideal. It's also uh, super useful for a rotary peeling technique. This would be where you cut um, a cucumber, for example, like very close to the skin to get a very, very thin cut and you kind of roll it out into almost like a sashimi um, uh, material, which then you can you know, chop up and you'd find this in like uh, sushi rolls and whatnot. And you can kind of see from this image as well that the single bevel is quite prominent uh, since only one side is ground.
The, um, the deba or kodeba, this is essentially a fish knife and kodeba just means like the small deba. Um, this is like a utility knife for breaking down um, and filleting whole fish. So it is quite a, a, um, a heavy and rustic knife, um, you know, traditionally used to clean whole fish um, and breaking down poultry and meat. Um, it has a bit more of a significant weight, so you can really drive it through like shells and, and bones and things of this nature and uh, usually a single bevel as well. So you can get really, really close to the bone. Um, so a useful, a useful knife for, for cleaning meat and fish. And then I added this one as sort of an example of probably like a real pro chef's knife. This is a Kiritsuke. This is a traditional multi-purpose knife made in a um, like a samurai sword style with the folded metal, the very long, extraordinarily sharp single bevel. And this would be used for um, sort of multi-purpose, but also tr probably most likely to, um, you know, make longer, more precise cuts for fish um, where you need a long blade with very little friction. So you don't get any dragging, no tearing, etc. And apparently these would be only used by like the executive chef. So this is like a real prize uh, item, um, something for only like the top people in the kitchen. So I want to talk a little bit about um, Japanese steel and what makes, essentially what makes Japanese knives like quite interesting and quite unique. Um, there are certain properties of Japanese steel which make it um, uh, quite good for uh, tooling and also for knives. Uh, because of the high ore deposits in Japan, that the steel that they're able to find has um, you know, higher concentrations of carbon in the steel than we find in Western steel or German steel. Uh, so this is, allows for uh, greater hardening of the steel overall, and harder steels are better for finer edges and better edge retention. The flip side of this is that they are more brittle and a little bit more less forgiving. So for example, if you drive the wrong blade into hard materials like bone, you may be prone to chipping it. If you drop it on the kitchen floor, it could crack or, or break. So you do have to be a little bit more careful with it, um, but they are can be made very, very sharp and um, will hold that sharpness very well. Now there are essentially like three different types of steel you might find in Japanese knives. There is like the pretty common stainless steel. This is probably what you'll find mostly in like Japanese, sorry, in um, Western knives or German knives. These are super resistant to corrosion and staining. Um, they're really easy to care for. I mean, you don't have to be too careful with them. You can leave them in the sink um, and they're not gonna get um, corroded or rusted, of course. The downside to the stainless is that they do have a lower hardness. Um, so, you know, they're not going to take an edge quite as well and they're not going to retain that edge, um, but they are a little bit more forgiving. So if you do strike a bone with it, or you do drop it on the counter, you're probably not going to chip or, or crack the blade. So, you know, for, um, an everyday all purpose knife, that might be actually what, what you, what you need. And we have like a semi stainless, um, this is going to incorporate a little bit more carbon in the steel. Um, it's going to be have uh, better edge retention than the stainless steel. It's still going to resist most staining, but you're probably going to want to um, baby it a little bit more, keep it dry, don't uh, leave acidic materials on it as it could uh, patina the steel, which, you know, some people honestly uh, really like the look of a uh, patina. It kind of gives it a bit of a, an aged look, but um, that can definitely happen if you're into more of a semi-stainless. And then third, what probably makes like the most um, like traditional Japanese knives are going to be carbon steel. So carbon steel has the best hardness and edge retention. Um, it allows for easy sharpening. So if you're, if you're sharpening at home on a whetstone, you're going to be able to get an edge much easier than trying to work with like a stainless or a semi stainless. The downside of this is that they are um, quite unforgiving. So you need to make sure you always keep them clean and dry. This is especially true for acidic materials like cutting tomatoes. Um, if you leave tomato juice on the blade, it will start to rust or corrode the blade, um, you know, within a matter of an hour or so. So um, you do have to keep mind of that. Um, 
And yeah, whenever you're using it, you just want to make sure you're wiping it off. Usually water itself is not going to be a huge deal, but anything that's a little bit more acidic will uh, patina or potentially rust uh, the metal. So there are a few famous grades of carbon, carbon steel in Japanese knives. When um, looking to buy a Japanese knife, there might be certain varieties or certain steel types of carbon steel that we look for. There are the blue Aogami Super and Aogami 1 and 2. Um, blue refers to the paper these come wrapped in, so it usually comes wrapped in a blue paper. Um, this has some alloy added to it, um, but is mostly high carbon and allows for a really, really sharp and tough working chef knife. So it's a little bit more forgiving. So for the everyday chef, someone working in the kitchen, um, this is going to be able to hold an edge really, really well and um, not be especially prone to um, chipping or cracking. The second one you'll find is white shirogami uh, one through three. Um, this is like a super, super pure steel, um, has a very low alloy content and is very high carbon. Um, you'll see this mostly in very, very fine blades, um, ones that are brought to a, you know, a very beautiful polish, um, more decorative blades. Anything that is going to be like very elite looking is probably going to be something in the white um, shirogami steel. Uh, and then a couple of differences between um, the Japanese blades, or sorry, Japanese knives and uh, Western ones are the handles, of course, uh, which are pretty distinctive. In the top image, you'll find a uh, variety of handles, which are sometimes, you know, one to two different types of wood. Sometimes they will use um, some either bone or horn as well for the more decorative parts. Um, and these handles are essentially just like tapped and glued on to the end of the blade, which is a, a tapered, um, tapered shank. This in contrast to like a Western handle, which really looks like it's meant to hold in your hand. You know, they're generally um, shaped into the blade and bolted on. So they look really, really robust. Um, this will also impact how we end up holding the knife, which I think we talk about uh, next. Yeah, so weight distribution and handling, the um, Japanese handles are quite light um, and the blades are also light, but this does force most of the weight of the knife more forward on the blade. And by um, doing that, you're going to want to end up holding the knife closer to, um, it, to the blade, which I'll, I'll demonstrate in a second. And because you are sort of choked up on the blade a little bit more, it gives you a better um, feel of what you're cutting into. And it tends to be quite well balanced in, in the hand as well. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing here so I can uh, show you a couple things. So um, this would be an example of like a, a Japanese petty, but in a Western style. So we have, you know, the Western handle where the blade is actually tapered into the handle here. And we see like, of course it is bolted in. Um, it runs the full length um, of the handle here. So you, know, you get really quite good stiffness throughout the entirety of the blade. I don't know how well you can see it, but you know, it, it does have markings and you see like sort of the, the waves of steel from the hammering here with the, uh, you know, the sharpened um, edge throughout so you kind of can see where the the harder portion of the steel is actually right at the knife's edge here this would be in contrast with the like japanese version of the petty which has the wooden handle you know it's two types of wood um, the blade itself is um, pressed and glued into the handle itself and because the weight is essentially right here in the middle of the blade you end up holding it right here so you, you, you pretty much pinch um, at the blade itself and it's, it's really, really well balanced in your hand and that gives you really good cutting performance and, and control. This is a little bit of more of a rustic uh, finish to it as well, which is really beautiful. It's another example of 
Um, one of the handles I really like, this has a D-shaped handle. So um, if you're right-handed like me, it just, it fits so well sort of in this crook of the fingers. Um, when I held this in the store, I was like, I have to have this because it just felt like, like uh, nothing else. And then you, you hold it again, it's very well balanced, pretty much always the right here. And so that's where you want to end up holding most of the weight. And then it really feels like it's, it's, it's very nimble, and very quick. So this is Santoku. Um, again, you have this beautiful uh, folding of the metal that you can still see in uh, the blade itself. This is my very favorite. Um, this is the Nakiri. And um, it's a bit more of a rustic blade. Each one of these, uh, they're all like handmade. So, um, you know, you can see some imperfections in the way they're hammered. The lengths are never the same. Like they could vary by a few millimeters. The height is never the same. Again, they can vary because these are all made by hand. Um, it has the distinctive uh, stamp marks. And being that this is a um, Aogami Super, it is like, made to be a daily workhorse uh, chef's knife. So, you know, little details like they epoxy in the knife here so that you don't get any water and, and rotting of the blade. Um, it's extraordinarily thin. Let's see if we can get it lined up here. And these are really fantastic for like breaking down carrots or potatoes when you need to be able to chop things very fast. And because it is quite tall, you get that, that room where when you're chopping next to your fingers, you're not at risk of getting your fingers under there because you have a lot of room to go up and down. So this is just fantastic. Um, it holds an edge very, very well. Um, but you can see that like, even with a little bit of home use, the blade here is a little bit patinaed, which is fine. Um, that just happens. The outer area of the blade is um, resistant to corrosion. It has sort of a semi stainless um, coat to it, but the very, very fine edge of the blade right here, this is the exposed um, carbon steel. So that's, that's what you really need to take care of. But it's a, it's really simple to, um, sharpen these. You just lay the single bevel, like right on the stone. You don't need to get like a micro bevel or anything. It's really just meant to be a, a super simple tool. So the next thing I was going to talk a little bit about are Japanese hand tools. So I figured this would be a good extension of uh, talking about Japanese knives because they are gonna use a lot of the similar materials. They have a sort of similar methodology to their use. Um, we'll start with saws. So um, most Japanese saws will actually pull, uh, cut on the pull stroke opposed to like a push saw. So if you're used to like, um, Western saws, you end up pushing them. This can sometimes be a problem as they can bind, or if the saw is quite thin, they can kind of flex and get stuck in the wood. Um, with, with the Japanese um, pull saw, they are quite thin and quite, you know, quite flexible, but because you, you cut on the pull stroke, it actually puts the blade under tension and holds it really, really quite uh, stiff and quite straight. So, um, you can get a good cut going without ever worrying about kind of twisting it and getting it bound. Um, so that is one property of Japanese um, hand saws is that they do cut on the pull stroke. They tend to also uh, are able to make the blades quite a bit thinner because you're pulling them, they can be more flexible. So you get these nice, beautiful, like really, really thin blades. This is a bit more of a modern take on a Japanese pull saw. This is a, um, this is a um, Ryoba. And you'll see it's double-sided as well. It has a coarser tooth for um, rip cutting or cutting down the, um, what do you call it? Down the, uh, the grain of the wood or a uh, cross cutting, which is um, much finer. So if you're making cross cuts that need to prevent tear out, um, this would be perfect for cutting across the grain. A saw for a little bit more precise uses would be the uh, Dazuki. This is even thinner, so it, it is extraordinarily thin. I think it's like a fraction of a millimeter. Um, this would mean that it's very, very flexible, but 
to sort of counteract that, there is a hardened um, spine along here, which keeps the blade quite stiff. And because this has a very, very thin uh, blade and very fine teeth, perfect for um, dovetail work where you need to get very, very clean, very, very precise cuts. However, this will not go very deep because of the spine. So you can only go, you know, a couple of inches max. So again, perfect for dovetails, not so good for cutting through like very, very thick stock. And then there is a third one. I don't have an example of it called the uh, Kataba, which is a single-sided blade similar um, to the Mizuki, but um, without a backing spine on it. So it, it can go deeper like on the, um, on the Ryoba saw. Um, we also have Japanese wood planes. Uh, these are really fascinating because this is kind of a cheaper, smaller uh, wood plane, but um, compared to a Western equivalent, um, the body itself is all wood. They're usually handmade. You would have a handmade um, uh, blade. We have what's called a chip breaker in here as well. And then like this retention pin. And the thing that's really fascinating about these is when, when you buy one, if you get one made new, they are mostly prepared for use, but you actually have to finish preparing them yourself when you get them. So there's a few things you need to do. The first thing is you have to relieve um, certain parts of the bottom. You need to make sure it's super flat first. So you would have to sand it uh, very flat on like a, um, on a granite block or a glass with sandpaper. And then you would use either a uh, chisel or um, scraper to actually remove just a little fraction of a, a millimeter of material in here and here to relieve the block um, so that the blade itself, which you can probably just barely see poking out here, um, can engage with the wood and start cutting very, very thin shavings of the wood. In addition to this, you need to prepare the blade. You need to make sure that the blade itself is very, very flat on the one side and then sharpen the edge. And to get these out, I think this is what actually attracted me, th these things to me, is they seem, they can be very precise, but they almost seem quite, um, uh, it's almost like quite rugged how you, you set these up. So if we were to take the chip breaker out, we can see that the blade itself, like it's just held in with tension. But to get that out, we would uh, tap the back of the, uh, the block itself and the blade comes out. And so, of course, I got sawdust over my desk. Um, and you have to like grind this flat. This is kind of a cheap blade, but you would uh, end up having to grind this down and then um, really sharpening this to a razor's edge where it could cut, um, could cut paper. And then when setting it up, you, um, oh, and you have to also make sure that this is super flat in here. So uh, part of the process is, you know, you put a little pencil mark on the blade and you drive it into the block and it'll leave little marks here. And then anytime you have a high spot where the marks might show up, you would take a, um, a chisel and just take little, little bits of that off. And you keep doing this process over and over until it's more or less even. And then as far as setting it up goes, you would just place the blade back in the block. And then with just little micro taps, like so small, you just keep, tapping it in and testing on the wood until you get something which is uh, just right. So um, this sort of reminds me of like, I used to be a trombone player and this kind of reminds me of like how you fine tune something which has no definite stops. Um, it's all, it's sort of an art to it. There's like, it's very precise. Uh, I kind of love that stuff. So um, yeah, you, you fine tune it by feel. Um, so I, I think that's kind of beautiful. And then, um, yeah, next part we're gonna talk about is chisels. So I did kind of mention chisels here. Um, Japanese chisels are another uh, really beautiful, interesting tool that are handmade. You can see that they're, um, like you see the maker stamp on here. I don't know if you can, it'll show up, but um, these are not especially expensive chisels. I think these are from Lee Valley, but um, they will have a, milder steel uh, body here, which will uh, be easier to sharpen and tune up. And then they do have a laminated 
um, hardened carbon steel uh, edge, which is just along the edge here. And the benefit of this is that you don't have something which is entirely tool steel, which would be really hard to uh, sharpen up. Uh, it would take a lot of time on the stones. So all you really have to do is sharpen uh, just the last little bit here to get a really, really sharp edge. Something else that's really unique about these as compared to Western uh, chisels are the, the blade is quite short. Usually a Western chisel would have a blade which is very, very long. And these are also recessed. So you can see in here, there's a bit of a, a hollow grind. And the benefit of this here is that you can run this flat on a stone and um, you don't have to work so much material off the blade. You just have to work it down until these edges are flat. And the middle is kind of uh, nothing, it doesn't matter. And then significantly, you really just need to get this end to like a really high polish for something very, very sharp. Um, so it should be flat, so you can get really, really close to whatever you're cutting. Uh, and then, you know, like a mirrored polish on the, uh, the blade itself here. They typically have like a round wooden handle and then they have these um, metal, I don't know what you call them, I guess, uh, retention ring on the end. And these come similar to the, um, the wood planes where when you get them, they're not actually complete. You have to finish them yourself. So you have to flatten the backs as best you can. Um, you need to sharpen these to a high polish. And you also need to uh, take these rings off and reset them. So you would pull the ring off you would hammer the outer edge of the wood so that it compresses, put the ring back on, and then soak the end of these in a little bit of water so they become soft and hammer them down so that you sort of create a, um, a rounded bevel of wood over top of the, of the metal ring so that when you're hammering these, you don't end up hitting the ring. You only are hitting the wood and uh, the ring stops the wood from splintering or cracking or splitting away. So they kind of work in tandem. And of course these come in different widths as well. So can, we have a whole set here. And then, yeah, finally, I guess the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, just sharpening. So I have, I have to pull these out, but we have like sharpening stones. So you can get sharpening stones that are like natural stones, like actual stones just pulled out of nature and, and made super, super flat, which are very, very good for uh, sharpening knives and tools. Um, they can also be extraordinarily expensive because they're rare and hard to, uh, hard to get. Um, you can also get like just uh, man-made stones, which are probably honestly just almost as good a fraction of the price and will last a really, really long time. And um, yeah, you would, you know, clamp these inside of your holder. And um, yeah, whatever you're sharpening, you would, you know, you probably do this on a table so, so that you can be precise, but you would just end up working this with water uh, across the stone, starting with a very, very coarse grit so that you can cut a lot of metal quickly and then moving up incrementally from like, you know, maybe starting with the 400 for, for starting a, uh, something that hasn't been sharpened in a while, going to a 1000 to get it much, much closer to a sharpened edge, and then uh, finishing off on something like a 5000, which would be for polishing. And if you're going to have like um, a whole bunch of blades like this, you are probably going to need some sort of a sharpening stone because you probably don't want someone else sharpening your knives for you. Um, unless, of course, they know Japanese knives very well, and then of course, but um, I wouldn't go to the local uh, guy with a sharpening wheel to sharpen your, your Japanese tools. Um, and yeah, I suppose that, that about sums it up. So uh, that's sort of my fascin fascination with um, Japanese knives and tools. I think they're um, aesthetically beautiful, very functional, and um, made in a style which um, I really enjoy using. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let me unpin you so i was gonna do a thing um where uh where we were just gonna not do any questions at all and then um uh we would 
asked like the show would be the questions and then if you weren't there then we would just make up the answers in you know, <laughs> typical binary jazz style but i'm really interested uh in um uh i am just gonna you know go back on that idea entirely uh because i have questions um what what made you interested in in japanese knives specifically it's like sort of a very specific sort of interest yeah so i should mention actually that um all the images from the slides were from this um, uh, local store in Toronto called, uh, well, I'm not in Toronto, but where we used to live, called Tosho Knife Arts. And it is the most um, beautiful store for, for Japanese knives I've ever been in. And they really know their stuff. And I went in there one day after walking by it many times, because, you know, I, I've always had sort of a, I liked having quality kitchen tools and stuff, went in there and, um, they have this amazing sales technique where they they can get you to cut a carrot in store. And if you cut that carrot, you're going to be walking away with that knife. So um, <laughs> I got suckered. I, I, I loved That's it. Fair. It was like no knife I'd ever used before. It just cut so effortlessly. And then, you know, once you have one, um, you know, it's a slippery slope. So I think the first one I ever got was, I want to say it was this guy here. And, you know, started off with like a Western handle uh, because that's what I was used to. And it was just so nice to use, so nice to hold. And then after that, you know, I started to really get into the more uh, traditional handles because I just love the way they feel. And also they're just, I think, more beautiful. Um, the, the materials are really, really ma uh, amazing. And they, it almost becomes secondary, you know, like it's not something you hold you know, not like this, but it's almost like a counterbalance that is um, just a beautiful addition. So yeah, aesthetically, I mean, I just love the way they look in the kitchen. And uh, um, yeah, once you have one, it's it, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see how that would happen. Um, about the handles, uh, you were talking about the differences between Western handles and Japanese handles and how uh, the Japanese handles are um, sort of like glued in and they're not like they're, you know, it's not bolted in the way that, that our handles are. And so it made me wonder if like the handles, if there's a, ever any sort of risk of like the blade coming out or if that's more of a risk, like you know, crappy old knives that you get at the secondhand store sort of thing. Like I wouldn't expect that, but like I, it seems like that's, that might be sort of a natural risk of, of the way that they're made, but I don't. Yeah. So they, they can, I suppose, come off. And this is probably something that will happen inevitably with age as, as maybe the wood, um, loses its moisture and contracts and then you know the the fit becomes a little bit looser um it's also possible that, you know that they get dropped or um they get cracked and then they need to be replaced but luckily you can buy these handles um aftermarket and um as far as i know if you get the right size they just need to be like epoxied in you just tap them on let them cure um of course you'd never want to put any of these knives in the dishwasher which would probably destroy the, the handles but i think that goes for for any any knife um, but, uh, yeah, the good news is you can, you can replace them and it, it's not a, a, as big of a job as like, you know, something like this, which would have to be like a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. You would have to drill these exactly. Like, in fact, you probably couldn't buy an off the shelf handle for this. You'd have to have one custom made. So, uh, in that way, it's probably a lot easier to replace the handle on a, a traditional, uh, Japanese knife. Awesome. Well, thank you for, uh, for sharing. And yeah, do, uh, do hang out.